Jesus' name. Amen. From Acts chapter 6, beginning at verse number 1, it reads, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews, <clears throat> excuse me, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the, num the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men full of, excuse me, of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of, the, of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas, Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. God's word is blessed. Amen. Amen. Sister Fran, come here for me for a second. Pray with me this morning. Amen. All right. My, uh, um, my pastor is Pastor John Jenkins. He's a pastor of First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. And, and um, sometimes on Sunday mornings, he says, um, since y'all didn't come to Bible study, I'm going to bring Bible study to y'all. <laughs> so I feel like him this morning and bringing what we taught this weekend on Sunday morning. Um, so we're talking about making serving great again. Thank you so much. And um, to set this up, I want to tell you about something that happened to me earlier this year. Um, in June, Lady Key and I, we got, had the opportunity to go to Chicago. We attended this, um, this conference called What Hath Justice to Do with Righteousness um, that, what, that was held at Progressive Baptist Church in Chicago. And um, when we got there, we got there on a Tuesday night. The conference started on Wednesday morning. And so we got there and had a good night's sleep, um, properly because our boys weren't with us. And when we woke up that morning, we went down to the lobby. And as we were getting ready to leave out the lobby, this lady came up to us. She bombarded us. Um, which is becoming a regular routine for some reason. Um, we didn't know her. She came up to us. She was like, um, can you turn the air up just a little bit so that it's not too cold for them? Uh, she came up to us and she said, y'all look like y'all going to the conference. Are y'all going to the conference? And we looked at her and said, what? We look like church people. We look like we, we, we going to church. She said, yeah. She said, can, we, can I get a ride with y'all? I said, yes, we're, we are going to the conference, but um, I had to get Lady Key's attention so she can give me the eye of whether or not it was okay. Uh, because, you know, this is COVID out here in these streets and everything. And so um, I looked at Lady Key and she gave me that glance like it was okay to give this lady a ride. And um, we went around the corner to get something um, to eat on our way there. And uh, while we were walking, she said to us, uh, I can't wait to get to the conference. She said, because my cousin is the person that's putting the conference on. Her cousin was the pastor who was putting the conference on. I said, oh, that's cool. I said, you know, he's a good friend of ours, and um, we're, we're here, you know, just to support him and to support the conference. She said, yep, I can't wait because I'm going to tell him that Deacon Perrin Rogers gave me a ride to the conference. She referred to me as a deacon. And um, what's interesting, though, is that I was actually flattered. <laughs> Lady Key brought it up later on. We were talking and when we were at the dinner. She said, she said, I know that that was the best compliment that she could have ever given you, <laughs> to call you Deacon Perrin Rogers. And I said, yep, you know it is. She probably couldn't give me a better compliment. Now, I admit that probably as, hearing that as a, someone who is a pastor, that might sound a bit unusual. But for me... The reason why it meant so much is because I know how significant the role of being a servant leader is at a local church. And I don't understand why more people don't want to be a deacon. Because I really don't understand why more people don't want to serve and to be a servant leader. Because do you know the way that Jesus says we can be great? is to be a servant. Amen. 
And so as she called me a deacon, she might as well have said to me, you are great. Because that's what serving means. That's what the word deacon means. It means to serve. In the original language in Greek, even in this passage that we see here, chapter 6 of Acts, in the original language, the word that we get the word deacon from is actually the word serve. Literally, it's the word, if you were to liter, um, literally translate it from Greek, it would be the word serve. And so every time you hear somebody call somebody deacon so-and-so or deacon is so-and-so, it's really like you're saying servant so-and-so and servant test so-and-so. So I don't understand why more people don't want to be a deacon. Because I don't understand why more people don't want to serve because I don't understand why more people wouldn't want to be great. Every person who serves in a leadership role at a local church, they are servant leaders. And even as a pastor, I'm a servant leader. I'm just the lead servant leader. But we are all servant leaders. There's a pastor, um, Pastor Emeritus of Metropolitan Baptist Church. His name is Reverend Dr. H. Beecher Hicks, uh, one of my favorite preachers. Um, I don't know at what time in his pastorate he did this, but in, at, at one time in his pastorate, he stopped using titles of deacon and deaconess and ministers and that type of stuff. And he referred to everyone to be a part of the diaconate, which is where we get the word deacon from. And he called himself the chief diaconate because he understood that as a pastor, our role is really just to serve. We are all servant leaders. And that means that servant leaders have the opportunity to be great. If you decide to serve, and particularly if you decide to serve as a servant leader, you have the opportunity to be great. Who doesn't want to be great? If you would turn with me to Mark chapter 10, Jesus explains this a little bit better. And we're going to go back to Acts, but in Mark chapter 6, Jesus' disciples, two in particular, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came up to Jesus and they said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. That's a bold thing to ask Jesus for. Are we at Mark chapter 10? Verse 35 on the screen. So they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, teacher, would you do for us whatever we ask of you? And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in glory. So they wanted to sit in a place of prominence. They wanted to be in a seat of where they would be seen because they were sitting next to Jesus. And Jesus says to them, you don't know what you're asking for. <laughs> Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I, am bat I will be baptized, I am baptized? And then they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the, with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. But when the ten heard it, the other ten disciples heard that these two disciples might get this place of prominence, you know they got indignant. They got indignant at James and John's, and, and Jesus called all of them to him, and they said to him, he wanted them to lean in. He, he said, listen, I want y'all to hear this. You know how those who are considered rulers of the Gentile, those who rule in the world, you know how they lord their rulership over folks? You know how the great ones in the world, those who are considered great in the world, they exercise authority over folks? He said, it should not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Jesus is saying, here is how you can be great. And here is how you can be great in the economy of God. It is by being a servant. I know that sounds crazy. It flips everything that we understand in our culture on its head, that Jesus would say the way to be great is to serve. But that's how it works in God's, king, um, God's economy, in God's kingdom. And verse 44 says, whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Hear what Jesus said, for even the son of man, 
came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If this is how we can be great in the economy of God, why is it that more people don't want to be deacons? Why is it that more people don't want to be servants? Why is it that more people don't look for opportunities to serve if that's how you can be great? I think that there are more people today who want to be famous, people who want to be out front, people who want to be prominent, people who want to have positions that they can be seen by other people. You know how many people want a title and want a stage and want a platform. Let me tell you, the platform, it's hot underneath these lights. <laughs> Some people, they want to preach. They want to be, they, they want people to see them, but they don't aspire to be great. They aspire to be seen. Being great should not be synonymous with being seen. Being great should be, not, be synonymous with serving. But I think that there's some folks on the other side of that coin who they don't want to be seen. They don't want the stage. They don't want the spotlight. They, they are fine just working behind the scenes. But they don't mind serving, but they don't want to be a servant leader because they don't ever want to be pushed to the front to help lead somebody. And I think that that's a shame, too, because what our world needs right now, and especially the church of God, what we need are servant leaders that would rise up in order to lead the local church and to lead our world. I think that it's a great thing to aspire to be a servant leader in the local church. And I believe that we need more people who will aspire to be servant leaders. Especially now, in this world where we're still trying to adjust with COVID going on and in this world that is polarized, in this world that is divided, we need servant leaders who will rise up in the local church and in our world and in our communities. We need servant leaders now more than ever. And today I hope to make that plain and clear to you. I want to make plain and clear to you the need for servant leaders, the need for servant leaders. Going back to Acts chapter 6, I want to paint the picture of what's going on here. It says at the first verse, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now here's what's going on is that this church, this is the first church that ever organized Right after Jesus ascended into heaven, he has resurrected, he's ascended into heaven, and the church is gathering. And here it is, it says that the disciples, the church, were increasing in number. And as they were growing, the church was growing, guess what happened? A complaint arose. The church was growing, and as the church started to grow, a complaint arose. And because the complaint arose, you know what was needed? Servant leaders. I want you to see what happens in this passage is that servant leaders rise up and are appointed to leadership positions to serve because of a complaint. It was because the complaints arose that servant leaders were needed. So if you're following, checking along with me in the notes, that first blank there, the need for servant leaders in the church arose because a complaint arose. The need for servant leaders in the church arose because a complaint arose. And here's one of the most common occurrences that will happen within a local church. Complaints going to be arising everywhere. <laughs> If you've been in church any amount of time, you know that complaints are going to arise everywhere. There will be complaints here. There will be complaints. I got a complaint. You got a complaint. All God's children got a complaint. And as off-putting as complaints can be at times, they shouldn't be surprising. Because as long as man has existed, there's been a complaint. Do you know that the Old Testament leader, Moses, y'all heard of Moses? Moses led the children of Israel out of slavery through the Red Sea being parted. That miracle. 
Moses led the children of Israel in the wilderness and God provided manna for them every day for them to eat. They would wake up in the morning and there would just be bread all over the ground. But guess what? Even Moses' folks that he led had complaints. Do you know that they murmured and complained all the time? They complained because they wanted to go back to the old days of being in slavery. They said, why you got us out here? You brought us out here to die. We'd rather be back in Egypt in slavery. Y'all got to watch the people who always want to return to the old days. (laughs) Always talking about what used to happen. They were complaining. Listen, y'all, they complained because they were tired of eating the same bread every day. The bread that they got to eat every day was a demonstration of a miracle every day. It literally was manna from heaven. They would wake up in the morning and the dew would turn into bread. And guess what they said? We tired of eating this miracle every day. Can we get some variety in what we are getting fed every day? Because as long as people have existed, they have complained and they have murmured and they have grumbled. And so there, if there is any common occurrence in the local church, is that there are going to be some folks who complain and murmur and grumble. Say, can we have some variety? Can we do something different? Can we go back and do what we used to do? But even as off-putting as it can be, I do want you to notice something, though, that when the complaint arose, servant leaders arose, and the servant leaders dealt with the complaint, and here's what happens after it's all said and done in verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Here it is. The complaint arose. The servant leaders arose and the church continued to grow. When servant leaders rise up to help deal with the complaints, growth can happen. And here's where we really need to press pause a little bit, because if you're like me, I don't always like complaints. But guess what? Sometimes complaints can be a good thing because they can lead to us finding a solution that will lead to further growth. Here it is. They complain and perhaps it was a legitimate complaint. And here's the thing is that sometimes in the church people complain, people grumble, people murmur. Yes, but guess what? All of those complaints are not bad complaints. Some of those complaints are legitimate complaints. Some of those complaints are valid. Some of those complaints we need you to complain about. Why? So that servant leaders can rise up to help deal with that complaint so that instead of the church continue to be divided, the church can be brought together in unity and the church can continue to grow. See, what happens is because of this need that arose, because of this complaint that arose, the Servant leaders stepped up to the task and they dealt with the complaint. They made sure that the Greek women and the Greek Hebrew um, Hebrew women, the widows, that they both got the portion that they needed. And as a result of that, the church continued to grow. I don't know about you, but I think that there is no better use of our time, talent and treasure than to help God grow his kingdom. There is no better use of our energy than to help God grow and advance his kingdom in this world. And so even in this situation, even though the enemy probably was trying to use that complaint to divide the church, even what the enemy meant for evil, God used it for good. And God used servant leaders to rise up in order that they would be able to help deal with the complaint so that the church would continue to grow. Our church needs to continue to grow. We need to grow deeper as disciples of Christ, but we also need to multiply greatly so that other people are experiencing the gospel and the freedom of being, of accepting Jesus as their savior, that they would miss hell and enjoy eternity with God. And so we need leaders who will rise up to help deal with the 
legitimate complaints so that the church will continue to grow. See, the enemy hates it when God's kingdom is being built. And he will use whatever he has to use in order to stop God's kingdom being built. But what if leaders rose up and said, no, we're not going to let this complaint divide us. We're going to figure out how to let this complaint actually grow us. Because that's what was happening in this passage. If I can give you a little bit of backdrop, in Acts chapter 2, it says that they had all gathered. To, they were all gathered. They were devoted. Verse 42, they were devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And um, at, towards the end, it says that they were breaking bread together in their homes, and God was adding to their number day by day. They were growing. A couple of chapters later in chapter um, four, it says that they all sold all their possessions. They said that they they had everything in common and nothing belonged to them because they were willing to use whatever they had in order to help one another. But then in two chapters, this complaint rose up. But even though the enemy tried to use it for evil, God used it for good by raising up servant leaders in the local church. Do you understand why servant leaders are needed in the local church? Acts chapter 6 is what many understand to be the first appointing of deacons in the local church. And so what you need to know in this passage, too, is that they say um, in verse number 2, the 12, um, 12 apostles they gathered the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, pick from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and full of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So second point there, if you did not get that, the appointment of servant leaders in the church, it resulted in what? Growth. Growth. But then... I want you to know that the words that you see there, the word in verse number two, at the latter part of verse number two, where it says, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. That word serve there is the same word in the original language. If you jump down to verse number four, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It is the same word ministry. Ministry is just the noun, ver um, noun version of the verb serve. And so both words mean the same thing, and it means to serve. It is from the Greek word diakonit, which means to serve. And so what the apostles are saying, listen, we shouldn't give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So we're going to appoint people to do this work of serving so that we can do this work of serving the word of God. See, that's why everybody in leadership in the local church are servants because some may serve the word of God and then some may serve the physical and felt needs of the local church. But everybody is a servant. And so we should all see ourselves first and foremost as servants. Number five on your page, I'm going to jump down to the first servant leaders were called to serve. Serve. But then I want you to look at these three characteristics of the first servant leaders. The first characteristic is that they were people of good repute. This means that they were people who had a good reputation. That when you looked across the breadth of that local church, these people were those who were well respected by everyone else. They were people who they knew that that person wasn't trying to live a godly life just to impress you, but because they really wanted to live under the fear and admonition of God. They really wanted to, God to get the glory in all aspects and areas of their life. They were people of good reputation. They were people full of the spirit. That means that they are people who were known for submitting to and yielding to the Holy Spirit's leadership in their life. They were people who that you could describe them as Galatians chapter 6 describes those, um, Galatians chapter 5 describes those who are full of the Spirit, who have the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, this is how they were viewed. They could tell that these people were full of the spirit because these people, they had patience. Now, y'all know not everybody has patience. 
Matter of fact, any patient that you see um, in me, it's only because of the Holy Spirit living inside of me. They were patient. They were gentle. They had self-control. And those, that combination of those things, I believe that that can only happen when someone is being, is, has been filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is indwelling in them. See, it wasn't that they spoke in tongues, and it's not that speaking in tongues is bad, but that was not the only indicator. It wasn't the indicator that made people know that they were, that they were full of the Spirit because you know that there can be people who speak in tongues but not have love. And so it wasn't that they spoke in just that they spoke in tongues. They maybe did, but they were people who demonstrated that they were yielding to and submitting to the Holy Spirit on a daily basis because they demonstrated the fruit of the Spirit of kindness, joy, love, peace, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. They weren't those who were quarrelsome and argumentative and that they were hot tempered. No, they were full of the Spirit, but also they were full of wisdom. These were people who they just they knew how to make good decisions. It was obvious that when 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 they found a problem or um, something needed to be solved, that they were able to make a good decision. They were wise. Do you know who the wisest person to ever live was? Solomon. Solomon was the wisest person to ever live. And you know what how we know how wise Solomon was? Is because they would bring disputes to Solomon and he would come up with a solution based off of his wisdom of how to resolve that dispute. Do you remember in the Old Testament, there's this story about Solomon. They bring these two mothers to Solomon and, and one mother, their son has died and the other mother, um, her son um, is still alive. And so the mother whose son died, she tried to make it seem like the son that was living was her son. And so they brought it to Solomon and they're trying to figure out how do we know whose son is who? Because she took the other son in the middle of the night so they didn't know whose son was who. They were newborns. And so they, they bring this issue to Solomon and Solomon comes up with this, this, this crazy, this crazy um, um, solution. He says, all right, we're going to cut this baby in half and we're going to give one, one side of it to this mother and the other side to this mother. As soon as Solomon said that the mother whose son was alive, she said, no, you're not going to do that. I'd rather that son go with the other mother than for my son to be killed. And that's how he was able to decide who was the real mother. Because he used wisdom in order to solve disputes. And that's what these people were like. They, you, they were able to come up with solutions to problems because they were full of wisdom. So these leaders rise up and they help, they help to grow the church because they deal with this complaint. And that lets us know that if you turn the page over, servant leaders are first and foremost shock absorbers. Shock absorbers. In Acts chapter 6, a complaint arose. And what do they do? In essence, they absorb the shock of that complaint by dealing with the complaint. They are those who keep down the complaints and the murmuring, and they address the need of the complaint so that it doesn't disrupt, dis destroy, destroy and disrupt and divide the local church. Another way of thinking about it is not only are they shock absorbers, but they are mufflers. You know what happens if you don't have a muffler on your car? It's going to be loud, right? And so what servant leaders are responsible for is to keep down the noise in the local church. It's not that they're trying to shut everyone up. They're trying to solve the issues so that that murmuring doesn't create a loud noise that destroys the local church. They are mufflers. They are shock absorbers. They take on the shock of hearing that something's not fair, something's not right, something's not equitable, something's not going as it should go. What's interesting about this passage is that the seven men that are put into a position of servant leadership, all of their names are Greek names. All of these names, and some of them I can't pronounce very good, they're Greek names. And this is significant because I want you to remember what the complaint was. The Hellenists, which is Greek widows, they were complaining 
that the Hebrew widows were getting more in the daily distribution of food than the Greek widows. And so all of the apostles were Hebrews. They were Jews. And so what they said was they might think that if we put Jews into servant leadership position, that it won't be fair and equitable. So we're going to make sure that even the people that we put in these positions are Greeks so that they know that we're going to try to be fair and equitable and that they get all that, they, that they're supposed to get. See, they were trying to look for solutions in order to keep the murmuring and the complaining down in order that everyone would be served and feel like they are not being overlooked. The unity of the local church was at stake. And they did whatever they could to maintain unity within the local church. They did whatever they could to maintain and make sure that people weren't complaining about something that could be resolved and be fixed. Servant leaders are those who know how to put out fires. They are good at conflict resolution. They are good at mediation. They love solutions more than they love drama. Servant leaders love solutions more than they love drama. Some of y'all saying to yourself, well, that already X's me out right there because I love some drama. Servant leaders love harmony and unity more than they love division and strife. Servant leaders know how to say things the right way that will be received by others. Because they are looking for ways to maintain unity. Servant leaders, they heal divisions. They serve and care for the physical and felt needs of the local church. But also, number two, um, well, number seven on your page, servant leaders provide relief to those who serve the word. Servant leaders provide relief to those who serve the word. So when these seven rose up and dealt with this complaint, it allowed those who were serving the word of God to be able to do that and not be divided in their energy of trying to serve tables and serve the word of God. It was so that those who were serving the word of God would basically just have to focus on doing that thing of serving the word of God because they knew that these seven men would be doing their things and making sure that those felt needs of the congregation were taken care of. And that provided relief. That, that relieved those who served the word of the Lord. That relieved them of some stress that they wouldn't have to deal with that no more. I'd be like, well, I know those seven are going to take care of that. So I can, I can just focus on making sure the word of God is being served to the local people. But also, number eight on your page, number three, servant leaders are problem solvers. They are those who know how to get stuff done. They are those, if you give them a task, you don't have to come behind them. You don't have to manage them. You don't have to prod them. You don't have to check on them. You know you give them a task, they're going to get it done. Whew, that is such a gift from the Lord. If you could tell somebody, can you handle this, please? And when you put it in their hands, you know that not only are they going to handle it, but they're going to bring it back to you even better than when you put it in their hands. They're not going to have to come to you and keep asking, all right, I need to stop. Stop. Let me go move on. <laughs> Servant leaders are those when they see a need, they look for how to solve it. When they see a need, they don't complain about it. Servant leaders say, oh, this needs to be dealt with. What can I do to solve this problem? This is tricky because all of us have a tendency to complain and to grumble and to point out errors and mistakes but servant leaders, when they see that area of growth, they don't complain about it. They get to work on it. Let me give you a few more things. You have six bullets there, but I'm actually going to give you seven things. I'm going to give you, if you're a leader, um, servant leader who came to the seminar, you're going to get an extra one today because God gave me one more. The first bullet is that servant leaders, their most important ability is availability. Their most important ability is availability. Here's why. Because you can have an ability, but if you don't have any availability, your ability really doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and so a lot of times, many people in the local church, they have 
so much ability, so much talent. They have so much skill. They have so many gifts. But guess what? They ain't ever available to use their ability to help grow the local church. And that's why servant leaders, their most important ability is availability. If you so busy that you ain't got time to serve God's work, you are too busy. If you are so busy that you don't have time for God's work, you are too busy. I only said it again because Brother Nigel told me to say it again. Listen, God needs your availability more than he needs your ability. Because if he doesn't have your availability, your ability means nothing. Make time to make yourself available for God's work. Because so many people, you're, you're talented, you're, you're gifted, you're skilled. You know how to get stuff done. But you can't use your ability because you're never available. Another thing that servant leaders are, here's the extra one if you were here um, over the weekend. Servant leaders are accountable. Servant leaders are accountable. Servant leaders, by being accountable, doesn't mean that I, I allow somebody always to speak to me to correct something. But sometimes being accountable really is going to whoever you're serving and saying, here is what I am doing. Let me put it this way. If, 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 if somebody is expecting you to be somewhere and you're not there, what should you do? You should tell that person that you're not going to be there, right? And so you should account yourself because they're going to be counting on you to be there and if you're not there and they can't count on you to be there and you've not made yourself accountable, what are they supposed to do? There are a few people in the church, it, doesn't, uh, it encourages me so much. If they're not going to be here for church, uh, they always send me a text message. Pastor P, I'm going to be out of town this weekend. I got to get something done. Pastor P, I won't be there this Sunday because I got some work that I got to finish. But it means so much that I don't even ask them where they are. They volunteer the information. Why? Because they're accountable. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen, but it's okay. (laughs) Next thing that you need to write is that servant leaders take the initiative. Servant leaders take the initiative. They don't wait to be told what to do. If they see a need, they take the initiative and try to get it done. Even if it's something that they have to make sure that whoever they're serving needs to sign off on, here's what the servant leader does. They take the initiative and so that when they bring what's needed, they see there's, a, there's something that needs some growth. When they bring it to the person that they're serving, they have a whole plan of how they can get it done, what will be the execution, how will you follow up on it, what are the things that might challenge and impede the growth of it so that the person that they're serving don't have to come up with the ish, um, solutions themselves. They take the initiative of coming up with solutions, not just complaining all the time. Servant leaders also anticipate needs and concerns. They are those who are often just looking around the room to make sure everything is like it should be. Is anything out of place that needs to be put in place? Is anyone out of place that shouldn't that needs to be put back into their they're just checking to make sure everything as, as, as it should be so that they can anticipate what might need to be done, that they can anticipate what people's concerns might be. Servant leaders routinely check on something or someone. Servant leaders routinely check on something or someone. Servant leaders must care about people. Servant leaders must care about people. This does not mean that servant leaders have to be people persons. But it is that they care about the souls and the livelihood of people and that they want to do what they can to help serve other people. Servant leaders are also committed to discipleship. Servant leaders are committed to discipleship. 
in the passage in Acts chapter 6, what's very interesting is that if you go to the next chapter, one of the, the, um, the men who were appointed to be a servant leader, his name was Stephen. And if you know anything about Stephen, Stephen in the next chapter, he would preach this long sermon and he would, get, he would be the first martyr of the early church. See, Stephen, it was obvious that he was committed to discipleship because not only did he learn how to serve tables, but then he would begin to serve the word of God by preaching because he was committed to discipleship. And here it is. He was gifted to preach, but he still was willing to serve tables. He was gifted and would be used to preach, but he still was able to serve tables. Do you know that your gift will make room for you if you'll just continue to serve faithfully? Don't worry about how God is going to use your gift. All you have to worry and know that God will use your gift and God will open the door when it's time for you to use your gift. You just do what God has told you to do right in this moment. He was gift. Not only was he gifted to preach, Stephen wasn't the only gifted to preach. Philip was also gifted to preach. If you know anything about Philip in a few chapters in chapter eight, he is going to witness to the um, Ethiopian eunuch. That's how we know that the gospel got to, the, um, to, to, to Africa, in the, and, and, and that's probably why so many early fathers of the church are Africans, because Philip preached the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. Amen. Philip preached the gospel even though he served tables. Yeah, yeah. He would be an evangelist for the Lord, but yet he was, he was appointed first to be a servant leader as one who would serve the felt needs of a local church. God will make room for your gift if you'll make yourself available to him to be used by him in any capacity. I don't think that we see this any better than when we see what Jesus did. In John chapter 13, Jesus is about to be arrested, to be taken, to be crucified on the cross. And in John chapter 13, it says at the, um, at the beginning of the passage that it was before the feast of the Passover. Jesus knew that his hour had come. He knew that he was about to depart out of this world to his father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, when the devil had already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the father had given him all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and he took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured the water into the base and began to wash his disciples' feet, wiping them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I want you to get the picture. It says that Jesus knew that his hour had come. Jesus knew he was about to be arrested and that he was going to die. He knew that his death was pending. He knew in just a little while he was going to be nailed to a cross. He's aware of this. Not only is he aware of that, but verse 11, it says he knew who was going to betray him. And that's what it says in the next verse. It said it was, it was he knew that um, having, um, during verse number two, during supper, when the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him, he knew that he was about to die. He knew that Judas was going to betray him, that he was going to be the one to turn him in unjustly. And he knew that the father had given all things into his hands. The father had given him all things in his hands. He's about to die. Can you imagine if you knew when you were about to die, what would you be doing if you knew you were about to die? All of us would kick into self-preservation mode. We wouldn't be doing something to serve somebody else. But when Jesus is about to die and when Jesus is about to be betrayed and when Jesus knows that he has all things in his hands, you know what he does with all things in his hands? He rises up, takes a towel and starts washing feet. That makes no sense. 
that when you're about to die, you know somebody is about to turn you in and they lying on you. And you know you've got power to resist what they're about to do to you. That you don't use that power to save yourself. You use that power to show them an illustration of what you're about to do for them. And so what does Jesus do? He does what was the most humiliating thing to do during that time. He washes feet. I know y'all like to go get your pedicure and your manicure and stuff like that. And, 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 and it, it, it's wonderful when they wash your feet. But that's, that ain't the same thing going on here. Because if I was to come around this room right now and start washing your feet, you would be appalled. It was a humiliating task. It was the task that was so menial that only the servants did it. And guess what? Jesus decides to do what the servants did. At the time when he has the most influence and the most power and everything in his hands, he is the most powerful in the room. He doesn't use his power to save himself. He uses his power to save everybody else. To be a servant. That's what Jesus does for us. Over in Mark, we read it earlier. Jesus said, not even the Son of Man has come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, this isn't the first time that Jesus took his power and, and went to the lowest position. Because Philippians 2 says Jesus didn't even use the glory as power that he had in heaven. He didn't grasp onto it. He emptied himself and he put God in flesh. God in flesh. That's what Jesus does. He always shows us how to really be great. He's always showing us how to take off our towels and serve someone else. And if we want to be great, we should see Jesus as our model. We should see Jesus as our motivation, particularly if you know that Jesus died for you, that he ransomed his life for you. Surely you want to be like the one who did that for you. How are you, the one that Jesus saved, going to try to make everybody serve you? Hello. When he himself did not even be, he wouldn't let himself be served. He was always looking for an opportunity to use his power to serve. I don't know if you have heard about this story of this guy um, on 9-11. Um, it was this guy, and they called him the guy in the red bandana. Anybody heard of his story? The guy in the red bandana? Yes, yeah, Sister Carrie, I'm not surprised you heard his story. You act like you haven't heard it before, and the people that were yesterday. The guy in the red bandana, um, his mother, he, he, he worked in the South Tower, of one of the, of, the, of the Twin Towers, and he worked on, I believe it was the 107th floor. It was either 107th or 104th. I think it was the 107th floor. He worked for this investment banking firm. He was just about 24, 25 years old. He had recently graduated from Boston College, and he had decided to go and work for this investment banking, um, banking firm. And that morning, he called his mother and left a voicemail and said, Mom, I'm okay, I'm safe. But that was the last that she would ever hear from him. And so she just assumed that he had died, and, um, but wasn't sure. And then not until, um, uh, May, April, not until March of the next year, March 2002, did she find out what had happened to her son. They, they found his remains at the bottom of the South Tower. His remains were just feet away from the door from him to escape. And she, she heard of that story, and she just... She was just so distraught, she wanted to know what happened. She just wanted to know what happened. 
And it wasn't until two months later that she was reading our article in the New York Times. It was this long article about just so many heroic things that had happened on that day, people that had rose up and to just do so many great acts. And, and, um, and she was reading, as she was reading, she started reading about these people who had this eyewitness of this of this guy who had a red bandana wrapped around his nose and his mouth to keep the debris out and um, how he was going, even though he was on the 107th floor, um, he had found one stairwell that was not blocked and he was helping to lead people down that stairwell all the way down to past the 70th floor. And, and, and they said that one time um, he, he used a fire extinguisher and he used the fire extinguisher to um, get the fire out and then he gave the fire extinguisher to this other lady and said, listen, I need you to go to hell me to get these fires out because there was a lady who was injured and he put her on her, his back and took her down the steps. He would go back and forth several times, leading people down the steps. They said that one time he took down his mask to tell people, mask and tell people, listen, I'm going back up to help save some other people. He was saving people even though it was going to end in his death. And as she's reading this story, they, they said that um, he probably saved at least 10 to 15 people's lives. And as she's reading the story of, this, of these eyewitnesses' account, she says to herself, that's my son. That was my son. And she ran and got her husband and told her husband to read it. She said, that was our son. Here's how she knew it was her son. Because not only did she know her son would step up and do something heroic at that time, it was the red bandana. And when the son was small, he went, they were going to church one Sunday, and they were getting all dressed up. That was back in the day when you get to, used to get dressed up for church. And he put on a suit. His, he was just probably about five years old. put on a suit, and um, his dad had on a suit as well. And his dad always wore a white pocket handkerchief up, up here in his pocket. And he said to his dad, Dad, can I get one of the pocket handkerchiefs like yours? Because he wanted to be like his dad. He loved his dad. And the father went and got a white pocket handkerchief, put it up there. But then he went and got a red bandana. And he said, now, son, the wine up here is for show, but this red bandana you put in your back pocket because that's for blow. That's what you use to blow your nose. That's what you use to clean up messes. That's what you use to help somebody else out. And he would always go around wherever he was. He would always have a red bandana with him. He loved his father so much. He wanted to be like his dad. Um, it was his father was actually a fireman. And his father, um, when he was young, would take his son with him to the fire station. They said when he was about seven years old, he would help wash the um, wash the, the, the fire trucks. They said by the time he was 16 or 17, he actually was part of the volunteer fire department because he loved serving. And even though he had gone on to school and was an investment banker, um, his father said that, um, that he had called um, his father. Um, the son had called the father a few uh, weeks earlier and said, I'm going to quit my investment banking job because I want to be a fireman full time. They went to his apartment in Manhattan and he had filled out um, a half, a half filled out, um, what is it called? Application. He wanted to be like his dad. He carried this red bandana around. They said he would wear it underneath his hockey helmet. He would wear it underneath his um, fireman helmet. He would wear it underneath um, um, when he went to school. He played at Boston College. He played lacrosse. He would always keep this red bandana. Somebody at his job saw him keeping this red bandana. He would always put it in his, in his suit pocket when he would go to work. And they saw it laying on his table one time. And they made fun of him and said, why are you always carrying that red bandana around? And he said, guess what? This red bandana is going to change the world one day. Because he wanted to be like his father. He carried a red bandana around wherever he went. And one day, because of what his father taught him, he was able to use that red bandana to change the world. Do you know that Jesus gives us a model of always looking for how we will use our towel? He wants us to see how he modeled for us what he did when he washed his disciples' feet. You know that Jesus was not a professional foot washer, but yet he washed his disciples' feet because towards the end of the passage in verse 14, he says to them, if then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. He says, for I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done. He's saying to us, you should always be looking for an opportunity to use your towel. 
Yeah, you got ability. Yeah, you're talented. Yeah, you're gifted. Yeah, you're filled with the Holy Ghost, fire baptized, with the mind run on, speaking in the evidence, um, uh, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But are you using your towel? Do you think that there are things that's beneath you that you don't, you, you're not going to wash feet? Uh-uh, that's, that's beneath me. I say that for the servants. Are you looking around the room to see how can I use my towel? That's what Jesus was doing. Jesus looked around the room, and Jesus noticed what everyone else should have noticed, but they overlooked. Jesus noticed that everybody's feet was dirty. And he said, here's an opportunity for me to show them what they really should be doing. And he shows us. He shows us by picking up his towel and wrapping it around his waist. He says, you, you should follow my example. I wonder if there's, I got a few more red. Anybody want to come get one? Don't come, don't come get this if you're not willing to, to serve like Jesus served. Anybody want to come, come get one? You want to commit to saying that I'm going to look for an opportunity to use my towel? Do you know that you know even though Jesus used that towel to wash their feet, I'm out of towels. You take a, you take a black one, though. You can take a black one. I got some black ones. Because I love y'all, can I, can I make, make a point out of y'all real quick? Some of us, we take too long to decide to come and get a towel. Well, we should have been first in line. Y'all know I love y'all. <laughs> Do you know what our church needs right now? Y'all know a lot of folks complaining. Because they complain to y'all. Y'all know a lot of folks are grumbling. Because they grumble to y'all. Y'all know a lot of folks are murmuring. Because they come to y'all with it. And guess what? That's an opportunity for growth. Not all of their complaints are bad complaints. Some of them are opportunities for us to grow. But if we don't have any servant leaders who will decide to pick up their towel and help with the work, we won't grow. You know what will happen? We'll stay divided. The name of this seminar was called Making Serving Great Again. And if you don't know, that's a play on another slogan that was going out starting in 2016, right? The former president, 45, he had this slogan called making something great again. And he was the most self-serving leader we've ever had. And you want to know what happens when self-serving leaders rise to places of position? It divides and it polarizes. And that's also what happens when servant leaders don't rise up. Because servant leaders rise up in order to maintain unity. But if they don't rise up, it'll continue to divide, and it'll continue to fracture, and it'll continue to polarize. We need servant leaders to rise up. Jesus not only shows us that when he washes feet, but when he gets to the cross, and he dies on the cross. Ephesians tells us that he unifies the church when he dies on the cross too. He brings the Jews and the Greeks and the Gentiles together in one body. See, yes, he died for your sin, but he also died to unify us. Jesus leaves us with these words in John chapter 13, verse 17. He says, if you know these things, if you know what's just been taught to you, disciples, blessed are you if you do them. See, many of us, we know, but we're not doing. Do we really know if we're not doing anything with what we know? Blessed are you if you do it. 
now more than ever, not only does our church need servant leaders that will rise up, but our world needs servant leaders that will rise up. As fractured and divided as our world is, as polarized as our world is, we need servant leaders to rise up. On your job, take this. Be a servant leader on your job. In your community, take this. Be a servant leader. In your family, take this and be a servant leader because we need servant leaders in our world so that our world won't be so divided. And certainly we need servant leaders in our local church. Father God, thank you for this time in your word.